Hey, this is Steve Bloom, and you are listening to the GeekCast Radio Network. You're tuned in to Steve Megatron on Altered Geek. Hello and welcome to Altered Geek. I'm your host, Steve Megatron Phillips. Today, I'd like to welcome to the program Matt Betts, a former radio on-air personality and newscaster, writer, poet, and huge pop culture junkie. Welcome, Matt. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. No problem. So, as I mentioned briefly off-air, uh, I, I see you've had a very diverse career. I think that's that's a that's a polite way of putting it. Yeah, I've, I've kind of been all over the place, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, it, I when I went to college, I, I thought, you know, this is well, this has been a while ago. You know, it's been twenty twenty ish years ago, some years ago, and um, I thought it'd be you know fun to be uh, on the radio. I thought that'd be a blast, and uh, so I went into college my my first week, and I said, oh, they've got a radio station here. So uh, me and like two other friends, we went there and said, hey, you know. Uh, can we get some kind of training? We'd love to be on the air sometime. They go, yeah, you'll start Monday. And, you know, this was like a Thursday or something, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they, yeah, so they really didn't give us any training there. They just kind of threw us in there. So, you know, I did news for the, for for uh, college station for a while. I also ended up, you know, doing uh, you know being a DJ uh, for a, a metal show for a little while and. Uh, so I really, you know, you kind of got thrown into it and you learned a lot of things. You learned about production and you learned, you know, uh, you learned, you know, how to handle yourself in an interview, you have, you know, how to interview others. And, uh, yeah, so it was all, uh, a pretty quick learning process. And, um, so I ended up, I was at school anyway for broadcasting and I, I ended up doing a lot of radio and, uh, doing a little bit of news here and there, you know, it was whatever, whatever sort of was available. Um, but I, it was kind of weird because I was, you know, I was there and I was, it was, you know, the, the big uh, uh, sort of alternative time, you know, it was when Seattle bands were big and grunge was just hitting and uh, I ended up working for oldies stations. So, you know, I was, you know, driving to work, listening to Nirvana and I'd get there and I'd be playing Elvis and Roy Orbison. <laughs> and, and so it was, which was, you know, it was fine by me, but it was just a really weird time for me to be absorbing all this culture. And I think that's where I kind of, you know, part of the reason I, you know, uh, consider myself a pop culture junkie is that I had this infusion of, of just sort of a little bit of everything. And uh, I ended up working for another oldie station later on when I came back to my hometown in Lima. And um, yeah, so, so yeah, I, I kind of had a, a, a very track with that. Um, I, I, you know, I've done a lot with publishing. I've done a lot of writing. Um, I, I do, I, I, I publish poetry as well, uh, speculative poetry. So I have horror poetry out there. Um, I interned at a TV station for a while and, you know, it's, it's, I, I worked at a comedy club as a waiter, which was probably one of my favorite jobs ever. And not, not the waiter part of it, but to go into these comedy clubs at the time and, uh, just, you know, have people come in and do their acts for a week and you could watch these people, these comedians like develop a joke, you know, you either had the people that came in that were trying new stuff to the people who had their act and did it and then got out, you know, but uh, over a week you could see the, the good ones are the ones, you know, who, who really paid attention to the audience, you know, take that kernel of a joke and mess with it and see how people reacted and, and things like that. So that yeah, had, I, I, that yeah, had to been fun. It was, yeah. I mean, I met a lot of, you know, a lot of really good comedians at the time, and it was a pretty big deal for comedy at the time too. It was, you know, it was in the early '90s, and like every cable show had their own comedy uh, special or comedy night or whatever, and so you got to see a lot of people coming in and doing stuff. And um, you know, it's 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 kind of like you know, when you're writing a book or when you're writing poetry or whatever, you know, taking that idea and and trying different things with it. And I think I learned a lot from them just by seeing how, you know, some of these really good comedians took an idea and ran with it, you know. That's awesome. The, yeah. I, I Just to be kind of a fly on the wall, just to kind of see how their their process works, had to be yeah. uh, part of the the fun of developing your own stuff. Yeah, it was. And, and, and you know, I, I think, you know, radio is a really great job, especially the, you know, when I was a DJ, you know, doing the nights or whatever, because you, you really were on your own. You got to you know, really work on something or you got to just go live and say whatever. And you had to have it, you know, it had to have some sort of rhythm to it. It had to have, you know, you, you couldn't be uh, stuttering like I am now, you know, you had to be smooth and get in and get out. And, and a lot of the comedians were like that, you know, they, they, you could tell by the demeanor, whether they were, you know, comfortable being on stage or, or whether they were new or whether they were trying something new and weren't quite comfortable with the joke. So yeah, it was, 
it was an interesting way to learn things. Uh, and like, I did that for like uh, two years. And like I said, a lot of great people came in and out of there that I got to watch them, you know, with their acts. So, yeah, terrific job. What were some of the, the biggest people you get to see come out of there? Well, see, when I say my favorite big person, people go, oh, I don't know who he is. You know, it's kind of hard to say this. But I don't know if you know Larry Miller. He's uh, 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 an actor. He's been in tons of stuff. Uh, he was in Pretty Woman. He was in, you know, still all the way back there. He was in uh, 10 Things I Hate About You and stuff like that. And he also was a, a comedian and he long before he was doing the acting. Um, and I, it was one of the last uh, last times I was at the club. I was, uh, you know, moving on. I got another job. And they let me come back and interview him for a class I was doing. And he just had all kinds of great advice. And he was just a terrific guy to sit down with. And, um, you know, gave me, you know, just as I was interviewing him, gave me advice, you know, great advice about myself as I was going through, you know, I was this college student with somebody I really looked up to. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry that I'm not really prepared. And he kind of said, you know what, you don't, you know, you never have to tell someone you're sorry about, you know, showing up and being you, I guess, you know, he, he, he kind of put me at ease talking to somebody. I was kind of flabbergasted around, you know, he kind of, um, I don't remember exactly how he put it, but he said, you know, you, you, you do the best you, you can be more or less. And, um, just a lot of other things he said stuck with me. He was, uh, like I said, he was in movies, he was a comedian and he, um, he went to school. I didn't know that until I interviewed him for, to be a musician. So he was like a concert pianist or something. And I said, wow, you know, that's a lot of creative stuff going on. And he said, well, you know, one thing kind of feeds into the other. You know, if I'm if I write a, a piano piece or I practice this piano piece, it helps me be creative when I, it's time to write or it, come, it, when it comes time to be on stage or in front of a camera. You know, just one thing you know, leads to another and, and they all sort of help each other and feed each other and make each other better. So it was kind of neat that I, you know, I felt pu pulled, obviously th describing my career careers, I guess um, I've always felt kind of pulled in uh, different directions. Cause I would love to do, you know, I love to write short stories. I love to write poetry. I love to write this and that. And he just sort of said, you know, it's okay to do it all, you know, it, it, as long as you do the best you can at all of them. And eventually they're all going to, you know, feel like one big, creative whole i guess that's that's really a great way of looking at it just feeding the creativity yeah 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 like i said it was a it was a terrific interview and i think i probably still got a copy of it somewhere that i i forget what i got in the class i don't know if i got a i don't think i got an a on it but it was still you know i enjoyed doing it so uh early that early on and and uh really was something that i don't know it really kind of spoke to me i guess Awesome. Awesome. So switching gears a little bit, what's, what's a comic book or, or cartoon property that's been kind of, uh, cause we kind of focus on heavily on cartoons and comic books on this network, but, uh, that's been kind of instrumental in your, your writings or in your, your career as a whole. Well, um, cartoons and comics, you know, when, growing up, I mean, I miss having Saturday morning cartoons, you know, even though I'm, you know, I, 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 I never had the chance to sit down with my kids and say, all right, it's Saturday morning. We're going to go watch, you know, whatever that schedule used to be. Let's see GI Joe's on at this time. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Godzilla's on and then the, uh, super friends. It, it just isn't the same now that it's all streaming, you know, it's like, you kind of took what you could get back then, you know, and you liked it. And, um, uh, it just isn't the same now, but, um, I wrote a, uh, I, I, I talked about some poetry I do, it's uh, speculative poetry. I wrote an entire book of poetry um, based on the Godzilla Saturday morning cartoon from the 70s, 70s and 80s. Um, and uh, eventually we got ready to publish it. And, and you know, the publisher got a little worried about getting sued by Toho and by NBC. Uh, they're very litigious about Godzilla, apparently Toho is. So I had to go back and sort of redo it. But to write that, originally the concept was that I was going to, that I did write actually, um, I think it was five poems for, uh, five poems for each episode. One of them was uh, like a haiku and, and the rest all were just revolved around that particular episode from the first season. And the title of each poem was a line of dialogue from that cartoon. So, and this was, you know, five or six years ago, but they had the whole first season of the Godzilla cartoon on um, Hulu at the time. So I sat there and watched all of these episodes over and over of Godzilla, uh, you know, these really sort of cheesy Godzilla cartoons uh, to the point where I'd be sitting there watching cartoons and my, my oldest son would sit there and go, 
dad, are you, are you really watching this again? Are you wa- we, we've seen this episode. And I go, yeah, but it's research. I'm working on something, you know. So I, <laughs> so basically I had 13 episodes, and I must have watched each of those episodes. I, I don't know how many times, you know, within a, a couple months span writing this book. And uh, I mean, when you're when you're a little kid, you're probably five or six at the time when he gets sick of cartoons, you know, you're you're obsessed or you're, you've got a problem, you know. But I, I remember that so fondly from my childhood. And then when I sat down to do this pro- project, I, I was kind of disappointed that it wasn't as awesome as I remembered. You know, it was very a very 80s cartoon or very 70s, 80s cartoon. Um, but I still was obsessed with it and I still, you know, I still love it. So that's one of them. And, and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned GI Joe. I loved that cartoon too. Um, you know, super friends was very, uh, a very big deal for me because, you know, that was, that led to a lot of other things, but it also led to other DC, you know, characters coming into their, their show to be like, Oh, I know who that car, you know, I know who that guy is and I know who that villain is, you know? So those, those three were pretty big for me. And, you know, Spider-Man, the cartoon they had for a while there was pretty big, too, for me. Yeah, but, I, I, I can know. definitely relate to things not living up to the glory of your childhood. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. We've, we've gone through on, on a couple of our podcasts reviewing uh, either uh, multiple episodes per podcast or uh, an entire series in a, in a podcast episode. And we're like, wow, this just <sighs> doesn't hold up. <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, we, we also, I, we were doing a, uh, I was at Dragon Con for the first time this year and we were having some panels. We started talking about, um, uh, uh, cartoons that were made from like rated R properties, but made into uh, children's cartoons. Like they had a Rambo cartoon for a while that, you know, the kids weren't old enough to actually go see the movie, but they decided maybe a Rambo cartoon would be a good idea for them. Um, they had, uh, I think they may have made a, uh. Oh, I can't think what the other one is, but there, we were just talking about all these properties that were, you were just thinking, why would anyone consider this a good idea for a kid, you know? <laughs> and But I remembered some of them. I remembered uh, Rambo very briefly, but there were a couple others that were just, you know, they were not child friendly, but they, they made them into a kid's cartoon. So, um, yeah, cartoons were a pretty big deal. Like I said, I mean, I remember a lot of the Hanna-Barbera stuff, Laugh Olympics and, and things like that when I was a kid. And, um, you know, these days you don't really see them much. I mean, we were talking the other day, um, some friends of mine about Bugs Bunny, um, you know, they, they're used to, they used to watch them, you know, Saturday mornings, but they also used to have them like in syndication. You could see them constantly and, and kids today just don't see that. Um, a, a lot of the ones that we used to see just aren't even available anymore, you know, because they were, you know, taken out of circulation for various reasons that, you know, I can't even show my kid a certain one that I loved when I was younger, you know? So, yeah, I mean, they were, they were huge. And, and when I write some of my books and, you know, and, and especially the poetry, not just that one book, I, I do bring a lot of that back. I mean, I, one of my favorite poems that was nominated for an award of mine that uh, was about Godzilla. Um, and it was sort of, you know, re- not just remembering the cartoon, but remembering, you know, some of the movies that I loved when I was a kid, too, uh, that, uh, you know, back when before the, the time of cable and <laughs> I, I lived in Lima, Ohio, which is sort of midway between Toledo and um, Cincinnati. So when we watched TV, we could get, um, if we were lucky, our antenna would pick up sometimes from Detroit, as far as Detroit. But usually it was Toledo, it was Dayton, and uh, maybe Columbus. And if I was very careful on the weekend, I could get a channel, I, f- I think it was for Detroit, that showed a monster movie every weekend or had two or three, you know, it's like their weekend creature feature or whatever. And I remember, you know, desperately trying to get the fuzz out so I could, you know, actually watch, you know, Rodan or whatever. So they were a big part and I worked for that, you know. So, <laughs> so I was very satisfied to get to watch those movies after a while because, you know, I, I knew what time they were on and I had to get that antenna line just perfectly and the wind was blowing. I could watch just about the whole movie. So uh, those were pretty important. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's a comic s- series or comic collection that you have that's the largest, uh, whatever that may be, character-wise <laughs> or, or ensemble? Uh, you know, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I collect a lot of things that I, I have trouble, you know, uh, picking up now because they, you know, I stopped for a while and then I thought, well, I, I want to try and finish this series. I mean, things like the original Marvel Godzilla uh, series only had like 24 or 25 issues, but I'm still having trouble finding a few of them here or there, you know. Um, I, I used to love Avengers. Um, I, I, I have some pretty old ones that are in terrible condition but they're still you know like some of some of the original giant size annuals of, of avengers uh like i think the number 
number five or something. It was pretty early on. I, I honestly don't remember the number right now, but um, I loved uh, I loved Avengers. I loved Daredevil. I was more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy. Um, I've just about the whole early run of GI Joe up to a point. Uh, Micronauts was a huge one that I loved, and Star Wars was probably one of one of the first comics that I collected. I bought the uh, the movie tie-ins from you know the original Star Wars, and then I just kept collecting, and it made sense to keep collecting because it was. You know, Star Wars was a huge deal for me when I was a kid. And uh, to be able to read these continuing adventures, which probably aren't canon anymore, um, was was great. I mean, it had some really super weird stuff that I just wouldn't see anywhere else. Um, you know, just different aliens and different you know concepts they tried to run with um, that. You know, I really enjoyed reading that for quite a while. And then after, you know, I forget how many, a hundred or so, a little more than that, I kind of got bored with it because they were, <clears throat> excuse me turning in on themselves and doing the same ideas over and over. So, uh, but I love the star Wars Marvel comics and I've looked, read some of the other series before. Uh, I mean, some of the other ones like dark horse and things, and I like those too, but uh, those marbles were so immediately after the movie. And it was funny because they would have these, these uh, runs and then they would hit a movie and they'd have to figure out how to work around that movie or how to, you know, retrofit what they'd written in with the movie. And, you know, like uh, I think they originally had, um, Jabba the Hutt uh, was this skinny sort of fish guy in, in, in the comic books. And then when they suddenly showed up on screen as this giant slug, I, uh, you know, uh, they had to hastily change the guy. But, um, yeah, it was, you know, it was it was like I said, it was kind of one of those things where everything sort of connected together in my childhood. Loved the movie, so went straight to the comic book and they did a great job for quite a while. So if we're looking at some of my bigger things, probably the Star Wars um I've read Iron Man for quite a while. It's kind of in and out of a lot of the Marvels for a while. It depended on who was drawing, who was writing, and uh, and what the storyline was, you know. Uh, I read uh, Iron Man for a long time. Uh, X-Men, I, I picked up about the uh, Brood uh, series. I think I, I guess all I cover and was mm-hmm. uh, excited about that. So that's where I started reading that and stayed with them for quite a while. So I, like all over the place. You know, there, was, there wasn't one thing that... that, that uh, that really uh, struck my fancy. It was just good storytelling. And if it was a good story that I, you know, really enjoyed, I stayed with it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, that, that's kind of how it was for a lot of, a, a lot of my, my comic collecting too. Nowadays, mm. it's just mostly because I like the cover art more so than right. anything else. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same way. I mean, if it's a great cover, um, I'm more likely to pick it up and read it. Even if the story was so, so, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I can think of a few. Like the the X Men, and then there were a couple of Daredevils, and I think I got started with Daredevil, and it was mainly because the the covers were terrific, um, and I and that brought me in. And then they had, after that, they had that good story, so I I, I hung around for it. So, uh, so what what are some uh, projects that you have uh, upcoming that you can kind of tell the listeners about? Well, uh, my first book was this sort of steampunk uh, action adventure thing with a little horror and a little of this and a little of that. And it was called Odd Men Out, and that came out in uh, 2013. And uh, my publisher liked enough that I got a con- uh, three more books with them. Uh, but one of the books had to be a sequel, and I am, I've done all the other books. So I'm writing the sequel for that one. Um, so it's actually done. It's with the editor right now, and we're going back and forth on um, – uh, we're going back and forth on edits and changes and things. So probably, um, uh, hopefully later on this year, I'm, I'm betting usually it'll come out. Usually they come out about um, July or October, July or August, excuse me. Um, but it's hard to say. I haven't seen their schedule for the year. I'm very excited about that one. It's a. Uh, uh, it took a while to figure out how where I wanted to go from the original story of Oddman out and. Uh, I kind of took a tangent and ran with it for that. And uh, it's kind of a combination of this uh, steampunk adventure, but I've added in this sort of Mission Impossible vibe to it because there's a a Confederate spy. It takes place during the Civil War. Uh, There's a Confederate spy who's sort of front and center for the sequel who wasn't at all in the first book. So um, I had a lot of fun writing that. I I, I got to do research. I'm putting air quotes around that by watching – all the spy movies I could get my hands on. So I went back and watched Mission Impossible. I watched a bunch of James Bonds and, you know, I just, um, a few other ones that just came out not too long ago. I, I, I were, were part of my research for that. Um, because I, 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 I like to take the tropes that are in there and the things that everybody expects from a, a spy movie or a spy novel and kind of, 
turn a little bit, you know, try and take it in a different direction. So, you know, I had to watch all those movies or I just wouldn't be you know, doing my job. Uh, so that one will be out later. I've got another book from uh, an Australian publisher called uh, – or the, the publisher is called Severed Press, and I've got a book coming out with them that's um, basically uh, – uh, I don't want to say it's, it's it's not monsters on a train like snakes on a train on a plane, but it's uh, it's something like that. There's um, uh, some genetically modified Bigfoot creatures that uh, are uh, – vex uh, some people who are trying to – get away, get away, get out of a snowstorm and it doesn't quite go so well for them. So, uh, I'm in the middle of writing that one. Uh, odds are that'll be sometime later this year. It'll come out, but uh, a lot of fun. I mean, that's, that's what I like about writing. You know, you just, you can take all these things that you loved reading about or, or, or watching on TV and find a way to put your own spin on it and, and take off. I mean, I was a big fan of, you know, like cryptozoology only they didn't call it that when I was a kid, you know, it was basically Bigfoot books and Loch Ness monster and ghosts and stuff. So, um, to be able to take all that stuff and just have fun with it now is just a, a blast. Yeah, I, I can I can totally relate to having fun with writing. I yeah. for a college course, I had to write a uh, TV show pilot screenplay. Oh wow! And, um, they because uh, uh, I took like an overarching media class, and they okay. um, uh, would have us write little short bits in the, in these stories. But what what I was using for my my character basis for it was uh, I took this uh, edx dot org uh, course on basically the function and, and like designing your own superhero universe. And so uh, I, I took those characters that I made in that and had to make kind of a light premise. And then I took the class again the next year. And so when I went into my my college course, we mixed. I, I mixed the two, and so one was taking place in the future, one was in the past, and then I kind of connected it with like a weird time travel aspect and, and created all my own. Uh, and and the teacher and everybody in the class is like, "That sounds really complicated." I'm like, "It doesn't. It, it doesn't." Like, right. Uh, it made perfect yeah. sense, but I, I really like anything with time travel, so it's it's a lot of fun to sit there and play with the the tropes there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people ask me to describe some of my books, I, you know, I always find it hard to do because I, I want to, I crush a lot of things up into the book. You know, it's like, you know, it's a zombie, uh, steampunk, uh, uh, adventure, horror, sci-fi novel, and but don't worry, it all comes together well. I promise. You know, it all works <laughs> out. I just can't explain it. You know, so no, I know exactly. You know what what you mean. We had um. We were supposed to do a newscast in college and, you know, we produce our own newscast, write the script and all this stuff. And instead of doing a regular newscast, I did like a, uh, a weekend update or, a, you know, something like that. Something that was more fun and with more, you know, just strange little cues here and there and uh, had a lot more fun with it than I think other people did. You know, they were doing it very straight and I decided to introduce a bunch of other they may have enjoyed doing it, but I enjoyed writing it and putting it all together even back then. So, um, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. That's very cool. So definitely looking forward to, to hearing more when those come out. Um, so how can the listeners get a hold of you and find out more about or interact with you online? Sure. Um, my website is uh, mattbetts.com, just M-A-T-T-B-E-T-T-S.com. Um, my, uh, Twitter handle, someone had already stolen, uh, Matt Betts <laughs> at Matt Betts. So I, it's, uh, at Betts underscore Matt, if you want to find me on Twitter. And, uh, I'm also on Facebook at, uh, Facebook slash, uh, facebook.com slash Matt Betts writes. Um, you can find me there. I am, uh, I, I, I'm trying to scale back my social media, but, um, I, I can't always do that. You know, when I get bored, I just can't help but dive back in and tweet stuff and retweet stuff. It's, it's a sickness really. Yes. Yes. They, they, they make it like that by design. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, exactly. Yeah. They know, they know that we're going to do that. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have all kinds of fun. You know, I'm, I'm always, you know, out there at cons and stuff too. I love attending, you know, sci-fi cons. And like I said, I went to dragon con. So, um, I'll just randomly run into people that I've met at other cons. Um, uh, I, I live in Columbus, Ohio now, and I went to dragon con down in Atlanta and I was walking up the stairs and literally ran into a guy that lives not too far from me and had no idea he was going. He had no idea I was going. We just, out of all those thousands of people, somehow we just bumped into each other on the stairs. So, Nice. Um, in fact, we hadn't met in Columbus. We met at another con in Chicago. So it's <laughs> uh, it's just this whole circle of wandering around and, and finding people and, and finding like minded people. You know, um, the cons have just been you know so supportive of my books and and uh, they, they, you know I do 
panels sometimes and I do, you know, workshops and, um, you know, people are just, you know, terrifically supportive of other authors and uh, they'll come if they're writers trying to learn something the, you know, the, they're always happy to compliment you if you've taught them something. So I love going out to, to cons. So yeah, cons, cons mm -hmm. are definitely a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to Stoker Con in a few. I don't know if you want to, if we want to plug this since I don't know how long we'll be, how far out we'll be. But uh, Stoker Con is the Horror Writers Conference, and that's always a blast. Um, it's in Grand Rapids, Michigan this year. Uh, the last time I went was in California on the Queen Mary, so that was that was a blast. Nice. Yeah, that's that's yeah. like that's like an hour and a half for me. So I, I'm right? in Michigan. Oh yeah. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Up in Grand Rapids. That's a. It's a. I'm going to drive from here. It should be a lot of fun. Mm hmm. Wow. So, uh, again, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with me on, on Altered Geek here. And, uh, yeah. so, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. No problem. So, until next time, get altered, get geeky with the Altered Geeks. <laughs>